Let's just uh, take a moment to pray. Uh, could somebody lead us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for the presence with us, though we are connected from different places. This morning, as we are eager to know the things that will unfold in the future, teach us, Lord, for their servant, so that we may be strong in our hope and faith. Look forward for your coming and prepare ourselves, Lord, and be yours at all times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Right. Thank you. All right. So we are still in this chapter where we are getting a um, panoramic overview or a, just a chronological overview of the sequence of events. Um, we started with the rapture of the church and then we've been going through sequentially um, uh, in all the events that would unfold. Um, we are essentially using the book of Revelation uh, as a chronology, uh, 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 a chronological unfolding of events as given to us in the book of Revelation. And that is a very, uh, and when you look at it, it's, it's, it's very logical, it's very clear. Um, and the book of Revelation makes you know, just is just so clear uh, when we read it that way, and when you just see that um, from chapter four onwards, there are things that have been given to us uh, of things to come. You know, so uh, just to quickly review, um, uh, we said that the rapture of the church takes place right before the beginning of chapter four, um, and uh, we have. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 that describe what happens in the rapture of the church. And then chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation is a scene in heaven with all the elders who have received their crowns, their white robes, they're seated on the throne. Chapter 6 is the beginning of the seven-year tribulation here on earth. And um, chapter 6 all the way to the end of chapter 10 is the first half of the tribulation. Mm, chapter 11 on is the second half of the tribulation. Um, we know that because chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, all mention the three and a half year period, meaning that they are con they are concerning things that will happen in the second half of the tribulation. So it's very clear and therefore it's very logical to say that chapter six to end of chapter 10 are things that are taking place prior to that midpoint. And so we see in chapter six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, uh, we see several things happening. Of course, uh, we see the, um, the seven seals and the seven trumpets, the two uh, main sets of judgments. We are seeing the uh, sorry, no, seven, yeah, seven seals, seven trumpets. And then we are seeing the, um, uh, 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 chapter seven, we see the 144,000 Jews, um, and uh, chapters um, eight and nine are the trumpets that are sounded and the judgments that take place on the earth. Chapter 10 is um, a parenthetical chapter where John is, the Apostle John is encouraged to eat a book that is just typifying that there's more that he has to prophesy. Um, and then chapter 11 begins the midpoint of the tribulation. There, chapter 11 talks about the two witnesses and what happens and how you know the, the temple or the city of Jerusalem is given to the Gentiles. Chapter 12 talks about how Satan comes with vengeance. He knows that his time is short. He has just three and a half years left and he comes to the vengeance. He goes against uh, the nation of Israel, basically instigating nations to go after Israel. Chapter 13 talks to us about the beast and the false prophet, basically the Antichrist and the false prophet. The Antichrist uh, comes on the scene, 
as a man now, he suddenly changes. He's going to be worshipped. Now he demands worship. The false prophet encourages people to worship the Antichrist. Uh, we see in a global economic system that is ushered in to control people. Uh, uh, a religious system brought in by the false prophet, getting people to worship the Antichrist. And those who refuse to do that, either to see the mark of the beast or the worship of the beast, they are killed. Chapter 14 gives us a view of the 144,000 Jews in heaven. And we also have uh, five angels proclaiming messages to the earth, uh, warning people, I mean, proclaiming the gospel, warning people not to receive the mark of the beast, and uh, uh, talking about, you know, um, uh, the great harvest and also the great judgment about to come. Chapter 15 gives us uh, uh, this another scene in heaven that has great multitudes of people worshiping the Lord. And uh, of course, these are people who have gone through the tribulation because they've refused the mark of the beast. And then chapter 16 is the final set of seven judgments, the bowl, seven bowls. Uh, and at the end of the seven bowls, is basically the preparation for the battle of Armageddon. Uh, the river Euphrates is dried up. A demon powers are released on the earth uh, to go forth and instigate all the nations to come together against uh, Israel, to gather together for the great battle of the Lord. Then just as nations are getting ready to prepare for the battle of Armageddon, two major things happen. One is the collapse of this religious system, this is this this system, uh, which was referred to as Mystery Babylon. This is in chapter 17. Uh, it just collapses because the people who supported the ten leaders who supported the Antichrist and the false prophet withdraw their support, and therefore this whole religious system collapses. Uh, and then in chapter 18, he said the financial system collapses. So this whole financial system that was brought in by the Antichrist, which Nations were participating and just collapses. Uh, and it's a global thing, you know. And, um, and uh, you know, Revelation 18 says, in one hour, all the wealth just disappears. And, and people are, are in such great distress because they see their wealth just uh, vanish in, 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 in an hour. So, uh, you know, and, uh, and like we were mentioning last week, uh, just looking at um, you know what's happening today uh, with Russia, with Ukraine, uh, with the economic sanctions against Russia, but you know it's like uh, uh, it's almost like um, an economic nuclear bomb has actually gone off in Russia. You know, so while Russia is threatening to throw out a physical nuclear bomb, uh, whether they realize it or not. Uh, there is a nuclear bomb already exploded in their nation, which is an economic nuclear bomb. Just, just come through all these sanctions, and it's an ongoing thing. You know, uh, more than 230 corporations or organizations have are withdrawn, or and, and many more are withdrawing, doing business in Russia. Just, it's, it's, it's just you know, it's hard to fathom the impact of these sanctions on that one nation. It's on time will just reveal uh, how devastating it is on that nation. But we're looking at, you know, and of course, we're looking at one nation sanctions, but think about when a global system collapses, it, imp it impacts every nation on the earth. You know, it's, it's going to be greatly devastating. And that's Revelation 18 uh, when we see that happening. Um, so right after that, Revelation 19 is the preparation for the Battle of Armageddon, heaven's preparation. So before that, in heaven, Revelation 19, we are seeing the marriage supper of the Lamb. But the Lord Jesus is sitting with his bride, the church, meaning all the redeemed saints. And we will have all the Old Testament saints, all the New Testament saints, all those who died up until that point or in heaven, sitting at this great table. And uh, Jesus spoke about it, you know, when he instituted the the, la the Last Supper, the Lord's uh, the Holy Communion, the Lord's Table that we refer to. He said, I will not drink this until I drink it with you in my kingdom. 
So he was talking about a future time and he would do this. And so Revelation 19 describes this marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, all the saints are arrayed. Uh, this is Revelation 19, verse 8. Um, they're, they're dressed in fine linen and they're at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verse 9. And then once that is over, this great supper is just a great time of reunion. And we don't know what all happens in that uh, that marriage supper of the Lamb that's happening up in heaven, whereas here on earth, the earth is in its worst moment, right? The nations are getting ready to come into Israel, come against Jerusalem and Israel. They're being mobilized, they're coming to war. Uh, things are in great distress. In heaven, the submarriage of the Lamb is taking place. And once that is over, Revelation 19, 11, John says, I saw the heaven opened and I saw the, Jesus, the Lord Jesus. He refers to, refers to him as the faithful and true who in righteousness judges and makes war. He says, he comes out of heaven and the armies of God, uh, armies in heaven, just following him on white horses. Now, they're coming forth from heaven. Now, this is John seeing this. Now, whether, you know, we are all coming literally on white horses or whether we're just descending uh, with speed and strength, uh, I, I, I don't know. But the Lord and all the hosts of heaven are coming. And verse 15 of Revelation 19 just says, just with the word of his mouth, he strikes the nations. So just one word, and that's how the battle of Armageddon takes place. One word, and he strikes all of these nations, right? And um, it says that uh, he treads the winepress of the fierceness of, of the Almighty God, of the wrath of the Almighty God. And there's such a great devastation, like we said, uh, we read earlier in Revelation 16, uh, as though... Uh, as the war was being announced, uh, uh, sorry, was it Revelation 16 or Revelation 14, 20? Uh, as the angel was announcing this, this great judgment, the angel said, blood will flow um, as high as the horse's bridle for 184 miles, almost 200, uh, almost to say 200 miles, you know, 20 kilometers. Uh, but there's going to be such a great devastation. And all of this will happen outside of the city, Jerusalem. And uh, with that, going, going back to Revelation 19, uh, the beast, Revelation 19, 20, the beast and the false prophet are captured and they're cast alive into the lake of fire. It's the, it's the end of them. And... Uh, um, so that's that's how the battle of Armageddon ends. So that's where we stopped um, last week, right? So now we're going to today. Our goal is to finish up uh, this whole sequence of events, cover chapters 20, 21, 22, go on through the millennium, millennium and the new heavens and the new earth. Just cover that all, all of that, and then next week you know, we will get into the signs of the times. That means. Uh, what are the signs that are indicative of where we are in this timeline, right? So we'll begin that next week. So our goal today is just to complete this sequence of events. What, what happens next? So with the Battle of Armageddon, uh, the wicked nations are destroyed with the word of his mouth. And uh, then Revelation 20, okay? I'm starting now with Revelation 20. So Satan is bound and he's cast away into a bottomless pit for 1000 years. And with that begins the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth for 1000 years. Now, there are passages that speak to us about the millennial reign of Christ. Now, if you kind of get into the details, one of the things we see at the start of the millennial reign, which is given to us right here in Revelation 20, is 
that all those who have been killed for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ during the tribulation are resurrected right there. So what did we say? At the time of rapture, that is before the beginning of the tribulation, every saint, every believer has died in Christ till that point is resurrected. Now Revelation 20 and verse 4 says, the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God, who, who did not worship the beast or did not receive the mark, they are raised up. And they live and reign with Christ for the thousand years. So this is Revelation 20 verses 4 and 5. So there's another resurrection here um, right after the tribulation right at the battle of Armageddon. All those who have been who have been killed during the tribulation for their faith in Christ have been resurrected. So obviously when they're resurrected, they come up with glorified bodies. So in the millennium, you're going to have people who come through with uh, who, who are, have glorified bodies. But you're also going to have people who've come through the tribulation who've not been killed who uh, who who come through with their human natural human bodies into the millennium and this is where many people position Matthew 25 the judge they call it the judgment of the nations where the sheep and the goats are separated and those who are alive refuse the mark of the beast, who are submitting themselves to the Lord, are ushered into the millennium. So there is the natural, natural people coming into the millennium. And the rest are killed or the goat nations are separated out. So the judgment of the nations happens there. And then life in the millennium is described for us in passages like Isaiah chapter 11, also Isaiah chapter 65, and also Daniel chapter 7, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That is the life in the millennium. Now, I'm not reading these passages now, we will read them uh, in our course next year when we just study Revelation and Daniel verse by verse. But I'm just mentioning that so you understand. Uh, or, okay, let's just read it so that you know what's there in the Bible. Let's just go to Isaiah 11. Maybe let's just read it. Let's take a moment to read um, Isaiah 11. All right. So, um, uh, could somebody read for us Isaiah 11? We just read up, uh, read a uh, part of this. I mean, we could read the whole, yeah, Isaiah 11, uh, Isaiah chapter 11, just to get a picture of what does the millennial life in the millennium look like, okay? Isaiah 11, verses 4 through 10, please. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the battling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, the young one shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord 
as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Mm. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So, remember, when Isaiah prophesied about the Lord, he said, and the government will be on his shoulder. Now, when Jesus came uh, 2,000 years ago, he did not carry the government on his shoulder. He came as Savior. He came to die on the cross. He came to, you know, to redeem man. So that aspect of Isaiah's prophecy was not literally fulfilled. And, and there are many other prophecies that talk about Jesus sitting on the throne of his father David and, and ruling and so on. So all those aspects of Bible prophecy concerning the reign of Christ is going to be fulfilled during this thousand year, what we refer to as the thousand year reign of Christ of the millennium. And so here in Isaiah 11, we're reading just one portion where how he is going to administer that kingdom and what will that kingdom or that millennial reign look like? There is a, a complete change in the very nature of things. As you can see the way it's described here, uh, you could also look at Isaiah 65. If you want to just get over there very quickly. Um, uh, it talks about what's going to happen, Isaiah 65. And now um, Isaiah 65 verses 17 to 18 talk about the new heavens and the new earth. So we have to uh, move them over to the other side, the after the millennium. But Isaiah 65, 20 to 25, talk about the millennium, the thousand year reign. Okay, so Isaiah 65, 17 to 19, talk about new heavens and the new earth, which come after the millennium. Right? And then Isaiah 65, 20 to 25 talk about the millennium which come before the new heavens and the new earth. Right? So those, those, the text has to be repositioned here in our understanding. Right? So let's read Isaiah 65, 20 to 25, please. Somebody can read it. Again, it's just describing life in the millennium. Shall I read, Pastor? Please. Isaiah 65, verse 20 to 25. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of the tree, so shall be the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble, for they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be that serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Amen. Hmm. So here again, it's almost um, a parallel scripture to um, what we read in Isaiah 11. Uh, but what's interesting, what I want, do want to point out is it's talking about people living, of course, long lives, but it's also talking about people dying. So obviously you can't put this in the new heavens and the new earth because the new heavens and new earth, nobody's going to die. So this passage is obviously referring to the millennium. So people are going to live and die, the ones who have moved into the millennium with natural bodies. They will procreate because it's talking about uh, Infant, infants being born, the child living for a hundred years. Uh, they will, we will have work to do because it talks about building houses and planting vineyards. Uh, it doesn't mean that's the only thing we're doing, but it's just typifying or signifying activity. Human uh, life in the millennium is going to be, you know, they're going to be doing things that here on the earth. Um, but 
it's not going to be unjust where you know somebody plants and another eats. You know, it's going to be something where people enjoy work. Um, it says we will not labor in vain. That's verse twenty-three, um, and uh, there were, you know this. Was, so the whole nature of things is going to be different, and then it talks about how the wolf and the lamb lying together, and and so on. So this is a passage that describes. Uh, what happens during the millennium. Uh, a couple of other things that we do know about the millennium is that the, the, the temple in Jerusalem is going to be re -con, you know, rededicated. So the Antichrist is going to come in and desecrate the temple, the latter part of the tribulation. And uh, it's very interesting in the book of Daniel when we when we get into it next year, we will see uh, there is a period of time. Uh, I think it's uh, forty-five days or so uh, in Daniel chapter twelve. You read uh, from the end of the tribulation to the you know to the beginning when this temple is reopened, uh, and and so there is this third temple uh, that is cleansed and sank, you know, rededicated. And Ezekiel talks about that, that the, the last few chapters of Ezekiel, he talks about the temple being rededicated. And um, uh, so all the way, um, Ezekiel 44 to 48, um, he describes how um, the temples are, re the temple is reopened and the glory of God fills the temple. And the, the sacrifices are reinstituted. And very interestingly, when you look at um, uh, Isaiah chapter 2, and these are parallel passages because they kind of repeat certain things. Isaiah chapter 2, Micah chapter 4, and Zechariah chapter 14, the nations of the earth come in to worship the Lord at this temple. All right. So since we are in Isaiah, if you just please... Turn back with me to Isaiah 2, just to read, just to get an idea of what is happening in the millennium. Uh, Isaiah 2, uh, maybe we could read um, verses uh, 1 through 5, please. Isaiah 2, 1 to 5. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come descendants of Jacob. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Mm. So here again, we know he's talking about the millennium. Thank you. We know he's talking about the millennium, right? He's talking about the Lord judging among the nations. And it's so much like what we already read in Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65. You know, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their pruning uh, and the spears into pruning hooks. And so there's a total change in the nature of things. But then at the same time, we see that people need to be taught the ways of the Lord. People are, people, you know, are, are needing to be instructed in the ways of the Lord. Who is going to do it? We know that the saints are going to rule over the nations. Right? So this is part of what we will be doing. While life on the earth is going on, uh, Daniel 7 talks about that the kingdoms will be given over to the Lord and to his saints. First Corinthians chapter 6, Paul wrote, he said, don't you know that the saints will judge the nations? Uh, so we will be administering the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and we will be involved in teaching the nations, right? Um, if you, um, and, and so this is, you know, brought out again in Micah chapter four. And uh, also if you look at, um, uh, if you turn the video please to Zechariah chapter 14, um, Zechariah chapter 14, uh, uh, verses uh, 16 to 21, Zechariah 14, 16 to 21. Somebody could read that for us. Zechariah, it's just before Malachi. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 to 21. Zechariah. Yeah, please go ahead. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles, and it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bales of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day, there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Mm. So, um, Zechariah 14 is again talking about, you know, what we read in Isaiah 2, that the nations will be brought in to worship the Lord. Now, notice in Isaiah 2, there didn't seem to be, you know, much reluctance among the nations, but Zechariah 14 kind of gives us the idea that uh, there may be some people who would be reluctant to come and worship the Lord, right? So he says, you know, uh, uh, Isaiah 14, Zechariah 14, 16, year after year, nations will go up to worship the king, and uh, the, uh, those who don't go, that's verse 17, you know. If they will not come up, then, you know, God is going to judge them. So in other words, these natural families that move in from the millennium, in, from the tribulation into the millennium, uh, they're, of course, going to procreate and increase and grow. Uh, they need to be taught the ways of the Lord. They will come to learn the ways of the Lord. But there could be some reluctance in, even among them. And so, you know, it talks about how God is going to deal with those people during the millennium. Why would there be the reluctance? Because they're still, uh, you know, natural people who have come come through the tribulation into the millennium, and that's there. They they still have free will. They can. God is not going to force them, uh, but uh, they're you know they're invited to come and worship the Lord in Jerusalem. So that Zechariah fourteen kind of brings that out, and. Uh, we also see a little bit of that in Isaiah 19, and I'm not going to read that, but it talks about a highway being built, uh, uh, an altar being built in Egypt and Syria, that those nations will become friends with uh, Israel, and uh, and they will, you know, they will want to worship the Lord. And of course, there may be some who are reluctant. So remember, these are Arab nations, Egypt, Syria, neighbors to Israel. Uh, Isaiah 19 talks about how altars will be built, and they will come to worship the Lord in uh, in in is uh, in Jerusalem. So, what is happening during the millennium? Life is going on. Uh, nation, you know, uh, there's the you know nation, nations all are at work. Um, the saints are administering the kingdom. Uh, they are teaching people the ways of the Lord. They're coming to worship the Lord. There is the temple uh, reinstituted there. Uh, now, 
of course, there's a question, why do we need the temple? Why do we need those sacrifices? It's not because there's a need for offering for sin, but um, most likely the reason is to be a constant reminder of what Christ did for us on the cross, and especially to, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to the Jews themselves and to the people from, from you know, the... Um, uh, in and around Israel, just a constant reminder, these sacrifices are still being done, not because they're paying for the sins of the world, but Christ is the one who has paid. You know? So that could be the only reason. I'm just trying to uh, uh, think through why would there be the need for this temple and sacrifices happening during the millennium. But Ezekiel 44 to 48 says that's what's going to be happening. Uh, and so these are some things we know about the millennium, putting all these different passages of scripture together. Uh, this is what's going to happen during the millennium. Now, this is a very strange thing. Now, we go back with me to Revelation 20, verse 7. Uh, so Revelation 20, verse 6 says that, you know, the that um, we will reign with Christ for a thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 6. And what is very strange is, Revelation 20, verse 7, that at the end of the thousand years, uh, the Bible is saying Satan will be released from his prison back onto the earth, Revelation 20, verse 8. He's going to deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth, and Gog and Magog are spe specifically mentioned. Now, I don't know why Gog and Magog are specifically mentioned, but um, um, most Bible scholars agree uh, that Gog and Magog refers to tribes and people who are part of Russia. And uh, they were involved, they are mentioned earlier in Ezekiel 37 and 38 in the buildup of the Battle of Armageddon. So they're involved in the Battle of Armageddon. Actually, they are the, they are the first movers uh, in the battle of that builds up towards Armageddon. That means these, these tribes mentioned there are basically part of Russia, and they're going to move against Israel. They're the first movers. They're going to want the ones who want to start all of these things. And here they are mentioned once again in Revelation 28, 20 and verse 8. Uh, and I don't know why, but they're mentioned. Um, but it, it clear, clearly says that he will gather, he will deceive all nations. So at the end of the thousand years, Satan's going to be released to deceive people. Now, whom can he deceive? Remember, there are two kinds of people on the earth. There are those who already have the resurrected bodies. Because it says, you know, we the, 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 the rapture has taken place before the seven years. At the end of the seven years, we already read Revelation 20, verse 4 and 5. Those who were killed during the tribulation also resurrected. So they are in the millennium. And also those who have come through the millennium. Uh, they are alive. And they have, of course, increased over a thousand years. The population has grown. For a thousand years, Satan has not been around to deceive them. The only problem they've had is to deal with their own natural uh, tendencies and willingly come and worship the Lord, to be taught how to worship the Lord. And then at the end of the thousand years, it says here, Satan is released from his prison to deceive the nations. And he seems to succeed in deceiving people because he's able to gather them to battle. And it says in Revelation 20, verse 8, whose number is as the sand of the sea. To gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. That means he's able to deceive many people. And that goes to show how great Satan's ability is to deceive people. Now, 
we can understand to some extent the um, the influence of uh, you know misinformation you know how how that actually controls the minds of people and we are seeing dictators like putin and to some extent even within china uh, using this to control the minds of people that means you control what information they are fed and therefore you control their lives you know perhaps also in north korea uh, so they're kind of oblivious to things happening outside of what they can, what information they're allowed to see. Now, I'm talking about in natural terms. But think about Satan's deception. He's released at the end of the thousand years. He goes to deceive nations. Uh, as you mentioned, Gog and Magog, uh, and I'm responding to Sissy's question in the chat. Gog and Magog... Um, most Bible scholars believe they are reference tribes in Russia. Uh, there is, they don't mention China, but they mention the tribes in Russia. That's also, you can see that in Ezekiel 37. So, um, Satan deceives the nations. And it says there, he's able to gather together, Revelation 20 verse eight, he's able to gather together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. That means huge numbers of people. So that's how serious demonic deception is. You know, today he is deceiving the nations. He's going to be released at the end of the thousand years to deceive nations and he's going to succeed deceiving many people. To do what? to go against Christ who was there in Jerusalem right but then it says in verse 9 so they come they surround the camp of the saints the beloved city so they're coming against Jerusalem but then it says fire came down from God from heaven and devoured them so that ends that whole thing so the big question is why does God allow this to happen I mean it's a strange ending He's bound for a thousand years. Why would he be allowed to, you know, do this in that final step? You know, I'd just like to hear your thoughts and then we'll take Say's question as well. So what do you think? Why does God allow that? Uh, why does he let Satan deceive the nations at the end of the thousand years? Why would he do, why would he do that? Anybody? Um, another refining, I see the VS comment. Uh, another refining of God's people, okay. Why would God release Satan at the end of the thousand years to deceive people? Anyone, anyone else? Um, Sir, can I share? Yeah, go ahead. Sir, I feel uh, from the beginning, God is uh, looking for people who are completely with all their with all their heart, minds, and souls and bodies to love Him, to love Him, and uh, He wants to see the people who really trust in the goodness of the Lord, in spite of the lies we hear or the deception we encounter. In the midst of that, he wants the people of, who really love him mm. and are alleged to him. That is mm. the reason why he allowed it, I think. Mm. Mm. Pastor? Mm. Yeah. Thank yeah. You, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks um, for all the other comments there. Uh, Anita Patromans, 125, Rose says, uh, effort to separate sheep from goats. Kennedy says, check God's people are committed to him. Uh, Sissy says people should only worship God and trust him. Yeah, so I think all your responses are kind of, you know, getting to the same thing, which is, uh, as Rupa said, uh, okay, who really follows Jesus, right? You've got the time to see him, to know him, uh, to 
you know, all of this has happened. The good things have happened. Now, many of these people have never lived through what you and I are living through. That means you and I today are living in an environment where the devil is at work, the world, there's evil in the world, and we are making a choice in, in the midst of all this to follow Jesus. So in the millennium, Satan has been taken out and his demons have been taken out. So there is less, you know, less evil. The only evil would be just the natural human tendencies that are there. Uh, and then you have Jesus, you have, you know, so basically uh, it's in a very, very wonderful environment to worship the Lord. There is no evil. And so like many of you have responded, uh, we are just thinking through, right? This is not chapter and verse, but we are thinking through on why would God do this? Why would the Lord allow Satan to be released at the end of the thousand years for that brief period? And I, I, and I agree with what all of you have said that it's, you know, just that it is that final attempt or final, you know, uh, separation, final screening, the final uh, test to show that you are choosing to follow Jesus. But I have a follow-up question. I have a follow-up question, which you can think over on the break, and we'll take it up after the break. The question is, how could Satan, the devil, possibly succeed in deceiving people on the earth at the end of the thousand years when they have actually, you know, they can go to Jerusalem to see Jesus. They can see how wonderful the millennium is. You know, we've read about the millennium. Uh, you know, he's using pictures like the lion and the ox will lie down together, meaning there's going to be this great sense of tranquility um, they, they will beat their swords into plowshares. I mean, there's this, you know, there's no war. So that's how the reign of Christ is going to be. And how could people living in such, you know, uh, uh, for a lack of a better word, in such perfect environment still get deceived? How could that be possible? I want you to think about that and then right after the break we will take up your answers and then we will also take up Say's question, okay? So the question is, imagine you're living in the millennium and, and from what we read, it's just perfect. There's no evil, there's no devil, there's no demons. It's perfect. Jesus is there. People are there to teach us about, teach people about the Lord. And yet when Satan is released at the end of the thousand years, he's still able to deceive people. The question is, how could that be possible? How, I mean, what, 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 what thoughts come to your mind on how could that possibly happen? So let's take a break for 10 minutes and we'll be back and we'll discuss this and also take up any other questions um, for the next class. Thanks.